Welcome. Everybody hear me? Let's do this. Fabulous. Hello. Welcome. I want to welcome everybody today to part two of the Access and Disability in Higher Education webinar series. Today we'll be talking about opportunities for change. We are very glad that you could join us. Uh, first, I want to let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded. I hope that it can be a resource for folks looking to have these conversations around access and inclusion in the future. So my name is Corin Parsons de Freitas. I am a PhD candidate in geography at the University of British Columbia. Any pronouns are fine with me as long as they're said respectfully. Um, I'm the moderator of this webinar today and one of the co-organizers of this series. Uh, I am a white person with short brown hair, greenish eyes and glasses. I am wearing a white colored shirt with little figures on it. Um, I think they're playing sports. Uh, it's not clear if they are non-disabled or if their, visible, their disabilities are not readily visible or if their disabilities are variable because you cannot tell a person's health status just by looking at them. Um, behind me is uh, some very impressively vintage wood paneling and um, some chairs and lamps. And I'll introduce the other co-organizers and panelists in just a moment, um, but a quick note on Zoom first. Uh, depending on your own preferences, you can either use the speaker mode or the gallery mode to view the presenters. The controls should be at the top of your screen. Uh, comments will be off during the panel, but please feel free to submit questions for the audience Q&A where it says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if someone has already uh, submitted your question, or if you think uh, someone has asked a particularly interesting question that you would like answered, you can upvote the questions there. All right, so I want to start us off by saying I'm grateful to be coming to you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, this land acknowledgement is only a very small piece of what needs to be an ongoing commitment to decolonization. We cannot do disability justice work without also doing um, decolonial work because colonization relies on ableism and ableism grows out of colonial relations. Um, we're also here today to talk about higher education. So we need to be very clear about the role of higher education um, and what it has been in uh, these oppressions. Institutions of higher education have been not merely complicit in these processes, but have played a central role in the oppression of indigenous people and disabled people and in the disabling of indigenous people. Universities continue to be spaces in which disabled people and indigenous people are more often treated as objects of inquiry than as colleagues and contributors, and that needs to change. So if you signed up for this webinar today in the spirit of disability justice, and Crip liberation, please also be here in the spirit of decolonization. If you're not local to us, as I understand many of you are not, I would like that you also, I would like to ask that you also reflect on your relationship to the specific indigenous communities on whose land you live and work and learn. Or for our international participants, um, I would like to ask you to take a moment to think about the additional forms that ongoing colonial relations take wherever you are and um, what you can do to dismantle them. So this is the second part of the Voices of Access and Disability in Higher Education webinar series. Our first panel was about defining access and identifying barriers. I'm not going to recap last week's discussion because I want our panelists to have as much time as possible, but as I said before, we will be making the recordings available. The topic of today's panel is opportunities for change. Uh, how can we move from the individual stories of resilience and resistance that we heard last week to collective action and systemic change? How can we better support our communities made up of learners and educators with diverse needs and abilities? This panel was co-organized by me, Rachel Chang, and Amanda Ma. Amanda is a master's student in occupational therapy at the University of Alberta. Rachel is an undergraduate student in geography here at UBC. And this panel was originally Rachel's idea. She tapped both Amanda and me to help bring it together. 
Um, and if I can just take a moment of moderator privilege, uh, I'd like to thank Rachel and Amanda personally because this has been a cross ability collaboration. And I think um, that honestly, one of the most sinister parts of ableism is that it robs you um, of the capacity to trust because there's always that possibility that you're going to be let down or left out at the very moments when you need your community the most. Um, and that's why working with Amanda and Rachel has been such a gift. Um, I have complete trust in these two fantastic people. Um, this experience of working with them has been proof that cross-ability organizing for disability justice is possible, um, that it's more powerful than I anticipated. And so Rachel and Amanda, thank you um, for the opportunity to do this with you. Uh, we also need to thank our sponsors. We received generous support from U-Town, Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, and the UBC Department of Geography's Equity and Diversity Committee. Because of their support, we were able to provide greater accessibility in the form of ASL interpreting, CART captioning, and honoraria for the panelists because the time, energy, and knowledge of disabled people is valuable and very rarely compensated. And uh, we elected not to charge for this event in the interest of greater financial accessibility, but we do ask that you contribute what you can to the Vancouver Black Therapy and Advocacy Fund and the Black and BC support, uh, excuse me, Community Support Fund for COVID-19. Both of the links to those, um, those organizations have been, um, Rachel's put those in the, the comment section. So our agenda for the rest of our time together is the following. We will do a short poll in order to get a sense of who has joined us today. And then we'll inter I'll introduce the panelists and ask them to provide a visual description of themselves. We will have a moderated question and answer session until around 6.45 Pacific time. After that, we'll take a five minute break. When we come back together, we'll have the audience Q&A. When submitting and answering questions, we would like to ask our audience and panelists to please avoid using ableist terms by which we made any language that equates disability with something bad. So if you mean unbelievable or immoral, please say unbelievable or immoral, don't say crazy. If you mean ignorant, uh, please say ignorant, don't say blind to language like that. Uh, during our panel, we encourage panelists and audience members alike to pay attention to your body minds and what they're telling you. If you need to move, please move. Eat if you need to eat. Stretch if you need to stretch. Just do whatever that helps you to take care of yourself and feel as comfortable as possible during the webinar. Uh, we understand that access is a process and that we are all learning to better support one another's needs. So we will be sending out a feedback form following the event. And we welcome your thoughts um, on what went well and also what could be improved for next time. Um, so now we'll do our poll. Uh, I'll read each of the questions and give everyone a moment to provide their answers. The first question is, what is your primary role within higher education? Undergraduate student, master's student, PhD candidate, faculty, staff. Oh, there are two staff options, it looks like. One of two staff options. <laughs> All right, we'll end that one. So it looks like about 25% of, oops, can I share this? No, I can't, there we go. Uh, so it looks like about 25% of the respondents are undergraduate students, 28% master's students, 15% PhD candidates, 17% faculty, and 15% staff. So welcome. It's nice to have a range. And will we get our next question? Yes. Um, have you seen positive change come from speaking out about slash addressing ableism at your institutions? Yes, I have. Very little or no, I have not. All 
All right, I'm going to close that out. So 18% um, have seen some change come from speaking about um, speaking out about or addressing ableism at their institutions. 64% uh, somewhat unsurprisingly have said very little change and 18% have said uh, no, no change at all. So those are not great numbers and something hopefully we will see start to change. And our last one. Are you aware of or involved in disability organizing at your campus? Yes, I am involved. Yes, I am aware, but not involved. Or no, I am not aware. All right, I'm going to end that poll as well. Oh, split pretty evenly. So about a third of people are involved, about a third of people are aware and not involved, and about a third of people are um, neither aware nor involved. All right, thanks very much. It's good to get a sense of who's here and what they're bringing to the table. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our five panelists. So um, we have with us today, Hannah Sullivan Facknitz, a queer settler, historian, artist, and activist. She is doing her MA in the UBC History Department where she's studying the experiences of incarcerated and dislocated, disabled, mad, sick, and, indivi and indigenous individuals. Her research speaks to the ways that life and all its attendant joy and sorrow happened in institutions like sanatoriums, asylums, and residential schools. She currently writes on tuberculosis and settler violence in North Vancouver. DP Lale is the Accessibility Collective Coordinator at CITR, UBC's campus radio station. DP's job is to form a team and help those who either have a disability or not and as a collective produce bi-weekly or weekly radio show called All Access Pass. Heather McCain is both the executive director of Creating Accessible Neighborhoods and a CRIP doula, which is a disability justice term for someone who helps disabled people navigate our complex systems, providing resources and support and building community. Laura Yvonne Bulk is a disabled scholar an occupational therapist, a public scholar, an accessibility advisor for students in health programs, an artist, an advocate, and a teacher. Her work as a public intellectual and PhD candidate in rehabilitation sciences at UBC focuses on enhancing a sense of belonging for people with disabilities in higher education and the profession. And finally, Vivian Lee is a co-founder of Autistics United Canada, a national self-advocacy organization by and for autistic people. Vivian studies behavioral neuroscience at Simon Fraser University and creates campus-wide change with the Disability and Neurodiversity Alliance. Vivian's work on unceded Coast Salish territory focuses on disability justice, collective community care, and autistic-led policy uh, and research. So I am grateful and excited to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and before we get into the questions, I'd just like to ask the panelists to quickly give a visual description of themselves and we'll go in the order in which you were introduced. So Hannah, will you start us off please? Sure, um, I'm Hannah. Uh, I am a white female presenting person with long brown hair. I'm wearing a green dress and a blue cardigan. Behind me, you will see what uh, many disabled people refer to as the sacred space of their bed. Um, this is my bed. You can see it has a, uh, a bed covering with boxes and flowers, as well as a small brown teddy bear in the background with white walls and some fake vines I put up the other day to make this look nice for y'all. Hi everyone, my name is DP and um, I, as you can see, normally I'm in my wheelchair, but 
I am actually laying on the bed and the bed um, is just a, a wooden bed and with a sheet and the sheet is black with some designs and um, orange and red, um, you know, little designs. And then from the back of me is a window with blinds. So that's covered and um, I'm a woman with um, darker and lighter skin. Oh, and okay. then more blue shirt. Brilliant, and Heather? Hello, I am a white non-binary person with a shaved head. I'm wearing headphones. I have glasses. Uh, behind me is my bed as well and uh, a wall full of photographs and a light fixture that has Bert and Ernie on it um, that I've had since I was a kid. And uh, thank you for having me here. Brilliant. Laura? Hey there, everyone. Uh, I am a white female presenting uh, woman, and I have long uh, brown hair, uh, which is down and off to my side. I'm wearing a sort of salmon colored cardigan and a black shirt. Um, I have, I think, blue and green eyes. I'm not sure. And my eyes are, um, are uh, closed halfway. Um, you might have noticed or might not have. Uh, I have earrings in that have little sort of black bean shaped uh, lime green bubbles on the end. Uh, and I am sitting outside right now and I think you can see the blue sky behind me, probably some clouds and some trees uh, and the occasional bug that flies past. Fantastic. Thank you. And Vivian. Hello, I'm Vivian. I am an East Asian person with glasses and short black hair, uh, sitting at a desk with my earbuds in and a pillow against the back of my chair. I am wearing a red t-shirt and a handbrake. Uh, next to me is a cup with a straw. So you may see me bending down to drink, drink, with it, drink from it. Um, behind me is the wall, closet, window, I'm just in my room. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, and now we'll go to our questions. Um, so question number one is, what is lost when disabled people are marginalized or excluded? And what can universities and colleges learn from us now with COVID and in general? Um, and if we can go to Hannah first. Excellent. Um, I think what I really want to start out emphasizing is that um, disabled and neurodivergent people are some of the most creative people on earth. Um, we have to solve complex and unique problems almost every day. Um, I feel like a structural engineer sometimes trying to figure out how I'm going to get all my fans to blow on my bed and move them around every day to, you know, maintain the right temperature in my room. Um, but we're also really astounding collaborators. Uh, but with COVID, most universities have completely ignored the input of disabled people. Um, I know that when the pandemic began, the experience really mimicked for me my own experiences with becoming bedbound. Um, I live with lupus. Um, I spent about five years of my life bed or housebound. Um, before coming to UBC for graduate school. Um, and when that happens, suddenly the world becomes very small, um, very slow, very new, and very terrifying, which I think a lot of us have experienced with COVID. Um, but one of the really important things I learned being bed and housebound for half a decade um, is that, yes, things will never, ever be the same. Um, yes, the world will be unmade in unpredictable and terrifying ways, um, but that unmaking is always, always an opportunity to create something else, something better. Um, but 
I'm finding universities are still clinging to the idea that somehow we're going to go back to normal, even though that normal was pretty staggering in, in its inequities, right? Um, it was violent and created and upheld the worst forms of exclusion in our societies. Um, we, when we divest ourselves, though, from that desire to return to normal, um, that normal that was defined by anti-Blackness, settler colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, we free up space to imagine higher education without those constraining forces. Um, I mean, even a world free of those constraining forces, which I know is so radical, but also not. Um, I think what I really want universities and people in general to get is that there is no normal to return to now. Um, we need to let this change us. Um, we need to see it as an opportunity because if we go back to normal, I consider that a deep dishonor um, of the staggering loss that we are, we have faced and will continue to face um, in the midst of this crisis. Thank you so much, Hannah. DP, do you have anything you'd like to say? I guess um, for me, I think it's just understanding um, that we have that compassion and uh, kindness. Um, what you see or the way you do things may not always be the same way. So you have to be accommodating and find ways that you can do things even if you're not there in person, like in, in places where you're normally used to be. And so you just have to find ways to do things. And maybe you might not even do those things, but it's okay you can find other things that will make you happy. And you just have to um, find alternative ways to do things and, and uh, accept it really. Um, I just, I think this is giving us um, ways to, um, you know, take care of ourselves, but also to um, do the things where you thought you never would do. For example, um, you know, now we're chatting through um, Zoom, and normally we would be probably in at UBC and gathering around, but this is another form of communicating and doing so um, just be open-minded, I guess. Thank you so much, DP. Heather, next. For me, what is lost is, most of all is that we're losing people's authentic participation. Um, we are not creating environments where people can offer everything that they have to offer. And that is affecting, negatively impacting our entire world. Um, people with disabilities have so much to offer and universities are making the system so hard to access that by the time they get through the gatekeeping and the access issues, it's hard to have the energy to actually give of what they can. And so I think it's really important that it's understood that it's not just the marginalization and exclusion, but it's the inability to actually access everything that the universities could be from disabled students. Um, and I really hope that moving forward, there's more conversations about how we can have participation in many ways, that education and learning does not have to look one way only. Um, it's been interesting because of COVID to have a lot of conversations come to the wider community that have been had in the disability justice uh, world for quite a while. Uh, conversations about the inequities, conversations about the need for adaption. To echo Hannah's point, uh, people with disabilities are the most adaptive <laughs> people you can ever meet because we're forced to be. Um, 
but there's such knowledge that is lost by not accessing that those adaptive skills and I really hope that the conversations moving forward because of COVID uh, show that with every crisis comes opportunity and out of that we can rebuild a more equitable world and that there are ways to have people be more aware of things that have been affecting the disability community for a long time and that's something that's been really interesting is to see non-disabled people become aware of conversations that we have been having um, and to have them increase their awareness as well as to become more curious about disability justice and how do we become more equitable and how do we work to ensure that everyone who is at the table is able to offer who they are authentically and fully. Um, and so I know that COVID is quite difficult for a lot of people, but I also see that there is a lot of good to be had from it. Um, and I think that we all have the ability to move this conversation forward and I appreciate the conversation today. Um, and I really hope that uh, moving forward, we're able to ensure that universities see that like all other students for many different demographics, disabled students have a lot to offer the universities, um, but that is a two way street. They need to work cooperatively with us and understand that we're partners in education. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Heather. Laura. Thank you all. I, I am going to not repeat, but say yes to the things that, that um, you folks have shared, um, empathy and creativity, problem to all of that. Yes. Um, I'm writing stuff down. Um, yeah, I think one of the things I'll add is thinking about diversity and thinking about disability as diversity and and there's been a lot of acknowledgement of the importance of diversity and often leaving disability out of that conversation and and so that's something I think that we're missing when when we are not there this uh, bouquet is not complete it's missing some of the beauty and I think that's something um, that is missing is humanity is beautiful because it's diverse. And so if we're missing a piece of that, um, we're missing some of the beauty and thinking about academia and some of the, the things that are valued in academia and innovation. Um, disability is innovation. And yeah, so I think, I think that's another piece we're missing when, when we, as disabled people are, are not there. Um, and thinking about COVID and um, yeah, to, to echo and hopefully build upon what you folks have said, um, thinking for me, it's been thinking about um, how can a terrible thing be redeemed and um, how can we redeem something out of a bad thing? How can, how can the the delicious mushrooms grow where there once was a forest fire. Um, and I think disabled people bring that. We bring hope um, to a situation that, that folks might have trouble finding it. Um, yeah, and I, I'm so excited. I could just keep jammering on, but I'm <laughs> going to invite someone else to jammer for a bit. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, Viv. Uh, yeah, so on, I'd like to build on this conversation about disabled wisdom in terms of adaptive skills, knowledge, and technology. We often talk about the curb cut effect, um, but I don't think that means just physical things like ramps, captioning, and so on that are helpful to a wide range of people. Um, there's a curb cut effect for how disabled people navigate and perceive the world, uh, the perspectives that we bring, things like inter interdependence, uh, collective access. These are conversations that we've been having in DJ spaces for a long time. Um, the creativity, collaboration, and compassion needed to help each other meet our needs, uh, access a space, um, be heard. It's the kind of critical thinking that can't be taught by an instructor. It needs to be a practice. 
It's something that only happens if you are actively working together to create space for one another. Um, so we can talk about how disabled people bring these perspectives in, but I think it can only really work if we're actually doing the work. Um, also had a bit of an issue with this question, Leslie. Um, I argue that our work should not be defined, but what we can teach able people. Um, we shouldn't be marginalized or excluded, period. Uh, barring us from education is a violation of human rights. We should be valued and included because we are human, um, just point blank. Um, and when I hear of a disabled person struggling to access education, I don't immediately think, oh, the university is losing out on learning from a disabled person. Um, for me, I think, okay, there are unique things that Vivian brings to the table, that Heather brings to the table, that Laura brings to the table, for example. And it's not just from being disabled, but from being individuals, from being people. And, and the loss of each individual's perspective and expertise is a, a loss of a whole lifetime of, of history and experience. Um, and you, you may be able to tell that I'm drawing from one of the 10 principles of display justice by Sins and Valid here. Uh, I'll read it out loud. I, I just copied it down because I thought it was really relevant to this conversation. Um, so it's recognizing wholeness. People have inherent worth outside of commodity relations and capitalistic, uh, capitalist notions of productivity. Each person is full of history and life experience. So I just want to bring that up here that it's not just about what we bring to the table as disabled people, it's what we bring to the table as human beings. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of your, your answers to your question to that question. Uh, Viv, thank you for, for pushing that question further, pushing us to um, do better, not just because of what disabled people can bring to the university, but because of who we are. Um, Moving on to our second question, uh, we discussed a bit in the first panel how higher education is so firmly rooted in ableism that ableism is often confused with academic rigor. And because of that, many people can't even imagine what accessible teaching and learning might look like. Um, so asking you, the panelists, what does a just, accessible, and welcoming academic community look like to you, and how would you measure equity and inclusion with respect to disability? And again, we'll start with Hannah. Great. Um, I think the thing I would really want to emphasize uh, for a just disabled space is that my program, my university, whatever I'm in, never expects me to overcome my disability. Um, there is no overcoming to it. Uh, there, I wrote down an example. I have a cognitive processing problem where I struggle to move short-term memory to long-term memory. Um, and you would think that that would pose problems for in academe, right? You're supposed to memorize everything, you're supposed to know everything, but I struggle with recall because a lot of the time my filing system in my brain is just not quite like everyone else's. But what it does mean is that I can reread texts and understand them in completely different ways over and over again. So I can read the same text three times and understand three different perspectives very quickly and pretty easily, if I'm honest. Um, and also, because of my body's fragility, I know about pacing, I know about being in things for the long haul, because I will never not have lupus, I will never not be disabled. Um, and I mean, our body minds are magic. Like I, I always latch onto that term. They're magic. Um, they're astounding. And I try and not think about things in terms of equity and inclusion because it just feels like another repackaging of diversity initiatives that don't really do much aside from put someone in a wheelchair on the mural for the rec center at UBC, uh, <laughs> which is a real thing here for those of you who are not familiar with UBC's campus, there is a mural with a man in a wheelchair in their inaccessible rec 
center. Um, but uh, I prefer to think about justice. And so I dream about um, being a part of an academy that loves my body um, and doesn't ever ask me to overcome it, but understands that fragility and my madness and my pain are in fact what make me a brilliant scholar. And I am not a brilliant scholar despite. Um, I really hate that despite or overcoming narrative. Often what disabled people have to overcome is actually the people celebrating their overcoming of something. Uh, so the academy, the institution is what we're overcoming, not actually our bodies or our minds or anything else about us. Thank you so much, Hannah. DP, to you, please. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say, like, everything must be acceptable for everyone to use. So accessibility is a, a, a really big thing, um, whether it's um, how do you write on boards or how do you, uh, when it comes to textbooks, you know, um, have alternative ways so that people can um, view it or use it. Um, also, um, when you have um, people who need to have support staff or um, someone to write notes, that, that's also you need to be accommodating. So being more accommodating as well, um, that's a big thing. And um, yeah, now that UDP is probably going to go on to online uh, classes, those need to be um, different ways to be accommodating for those who need to uh, attend, uh, you know, use classes. So accommodating and, you know, being uh, accessible on everything that you use. So that's my answer. Thank you so much. To Heather, please. Um, I think what stood out for me within this question were the words welcoming and inclusion, because inclusion is actually not inclusive, and I don't necessarily want something that is welcoming. I want something ex that expects my participation, and welcoming and inclusion tends to center one group that is then allowing another group in. Um, and the problem with that is that it is then um, perceived as a gift and all gifts can be taken away. And that is how accessibility is often treated. It's treated as a gift that is given to people with disabilities and at any point it can be taken away and that we are supposed to be appreciative for being given this gift. And as Vivian said in, earlier, I don't want to have to thank people for being given the right to be in the room because I already have that right. Um, and this is a big issue with accessibility and with having equity for people with disabilities is that it's constantly um, handed to us is kind of how it's seen. And, and I wanna move beyond that. I wanna move away from accommodation. I wanna to move to accessibility where we don't have to get doctor's notes and you don't have to work through gatekeeping. And as I see in one of the questions here, you don't have to explain to non-disabled people why you are disabled or why you are disabled enough to get accommodations because it's dehumanizing, it's demoralizing, and it makes people quit because you don't want to keep fighting a system that is set up by people who have never had your experiences and can't understand um, and who then tell you that you're not trying hard enough or you're not working within the system. Um, and so for me, what a just and accessible academic community would be is one where I'm not constantly having to thank them for having that curb cut or thank them for understanding that not everyone learns in the same way or thank them for including ASL within the classes. Um, I would measure an equitable system uh, with respect to disability with the fact that my disability would not be an ever-present um, kind of 
thing that has to be discussed, that has to be worked around, that has to be accommodated, it would be expected. Um, and not only for myself, but also because there's a lot of people who don't self-identify as having a disability who benefit from accessibility. Um, and I see this with my workshops where I bring STEM toys and you get people who don't have disabilities and they say, oh, well, we don't need STEM toys and they wouldn't do it any good. And then about halfway through, they start to play with one. And then by the end of the workshop, they're like, wow, these really helped me concentrate or these really helped me pay attention and stay awake or they did this for me or they did that. And that's the thing too, is that we're not just talking about students with disabilities or um, anybody with disabilities within the educational system, but how this will benefit us all um, because what is good for people with disabilities is good for the overall population. Thank you so much, Heather. Laura. All right. Again, well said, everyone. Um, a few things I'll, I'll add. So I want to acknowledge that some of um, my thinking around this has been shaped by research I've done um, with other disabled people in academia. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that and acknowledge them um, for sharing their stories with me um, and allowing me to share mine with them. Uh, so picking up on um, Heather, you talk about being expected. Um, oh, that is so important. Um, so my work's around belonging and one of the things is, yeah, when you're in a space where you're like this anomaly, We've never had one of you before. Um, that is, it's, it's, that does not make you feel like you belong. And to me, accessibility um, should, I wish, it should also be about belonging. It should be creating a space where I can feel like I belong or I can have the choice if I want to create a place of belonging in, in that space. Um, so yes, being expected, I think accessibility, it's also about not feeling like a burden. Um, Heather, I think it was Heather talked a bit about kind of that burden that we carry in terms of we don't have the energy to engage in all the university has to offer because we're expending all this energy just getting in. And then you also expend energy being there um, and trying to gain and maintain access. Um, and then, so that those are burdens on us. And then there's the additional piece of I'm not of being made to feel as if I'm a burden. Like if if it really is this tough, then maybe I don't belong here. Um, maybe I am too much trouble. Um, and so an accessible and and just space would make me feel like I am expected. I do belong. I'm not too much trouble. Um, and it would not be singling me out every time as the blind one. Um, although that is a beautiful part of my identity and I love that part of my identity. Um, you, you don't need to remind me every time and I shouldn't need to remind you every time when I need things in a way that you didn't design them from the start. Um, and um, I think another piece that I'll add is all of this kind of relates to this idea of needing to perform and uh, adjust an accessible space as one in which I don't need to perform the right blind person, the right kind of blind person. I should be allowed to be a grumpy blind person sometimes or just a grumpy person <laughs> sometimes. Um, so a just and accessible space is one in which I can be my authentic self, um, to use the words of, of folks I talked with. Um, and, and that's also, it's for everyone in, in the space. So, so often I find in higher education and academia, we talk about students, you know what? As, as staff, as teachers, as uh, everyone, as, the, as staff, no matter where they're working on the campus, as guests, we all create this space together. We're all in relationship with one another and with the space in some way. And so I think it's important to think about it being just 
and accessible through various lenses um, and for various people. So if, if a space is like, uh, for example, if, if, it's, if there are no efforts around decolonization in a space, sorry, it's also not just or accessible for me. Um, so I think, yeah, having that intersectional, to use the word, the vernacular um, way of thinking about it, um, I think it's very important and, and in, including um, and being mindful of, um, yeah, the various um, people who are part of that community. Thank you so much, Laura and Viv. Um, yeah, I really liked what Hannah said earlier about celebrating disability as a strength in academia rather than something to overcome. Um, our body minds are magic. I love that. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to steal it from you. Um, with your permission. Uh, I, I just did a random brainstorm uh, on the question when we received it earlier this week. and. I have some broad topics, and there might be some overlap with other panelists. Um, big one for me was choice. Um, a just and accessible community to me is one where I can get into the building without help having to having to puzzle out segregated accessible routes. One where I can choose how I get into the building. One where I can choose where I can sit, like anyone else, and actually sit there. One where I don't have to choose between sitting in an area that's okay for my sensory issues but terrible for my chronic pain or vice versa. Um, another big point for me as a student is financial access. Um, a just community is one where I'm not worrying about food or keeping a roof over my head because the majority of my finances goes to, to tuition, where I'm constantly trying to meet the requirements for scholarships and, and also not needing to put my trauma on display to play into the overcoming or super trip narrative to get financial access for all these scholarship essays, because often that's what they want out of an adverse, ad, overcoming ad, adversary. I can't say that word. Um, scholarship essay. Um, I like that, Laura, you brought up intersectionality because um, a just and accessible community is one where I don't have to keep important parts of my life experience or cultural background hidden. Um, because I might be devalued because of that. Um, a welcoming community is one that celebrates all of my identities. Um, I'm tired of institutions being like, yeah, we can work with an autistic person, but not an autistic, multiply disabled, queer person of color. That's just a bit too much. Uh, so I'm tired of hearing that. Um, I had some thoughts about mentorship. Um, so an accessible and just community and a welcoming one is one where I can find mentors that are like me and not just on a single axis like disability, um, mentors that have gone through similar struggles. Um, like my generation is the first one that has um, gone to higher education of all my cousins, my brother as well. Um, how do we talk about disabled trauma that results from war because my family were refugees? Um, like that's complicated. Um, and I, it's a hard to find mentors that have gone through something similar like that. Um, and I'd like to see that they have gone through those similar struggles and are there because they found a place within academia, not because they have overcome barriers, but because academia has a, made a place for them and then therefore for me. Um, so in general, just a, a community where I can actually focus on my learning and contributing to knowledge and expertise rather than all these barriers before I even enter the classroom. Um, I also had a note, I note about collective learning being something I really like in classrooms um, where teaching and learning is a collective endeavor where we all learn from each other instead of like, I'm the instructor and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know because I find that's a really oppressive framework to learn in. Um, Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. I have, I have like, I have goosebumps after that round. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. Um, so for our audience, we are going to push back our break just a little bit so that we can get in um, a third question before we take a break. Then we will break and come back for um, the Q&A from the audience. So 
our final question, panelists, before the break um, is institutions often prioritize accommodation over accessibility, let alone disability justice. Why is an accommodation-centered approach insufficient? And can you share a concrete example of accessibility or disability justice in an educational setting? So again, we'll start with Hannah. Great. Um, the first thing I want to say is sort of short and sweet, and it's especially directed at anyone who works as staff or faculty at a uh, institution of higher education. It's that the Center for Accessibility or the Disability Services Office or whatever it's called at your institution does not exist to protect your disabled students. It exists to protect the institution from litigation. So the accommodations that come out of there are one, the bare minimum, and two are a one size fits all solution. Um, I, with uh, the cognitive processing issues I have and chronic pain, was given the same um, uh, accommodations as someone with ADHD. And they're different. Um, some things overlap, um, but a lot of them don't. <laughs> so, um, but also one of the big problems with it is something that Vivian alluded to is that disabled students uh, and disabled people in academia seeking accommodations are um, repeatedly asked to re-perform or perform their trauma. So um, I wrote down a few examples of um, ways that I've had to re-perform my trauma or provide very intimate medical information to institutions that um, are where eugenics originated. So, um, so for example, a scholarship that I won uh, has my blood work because it required a medical clearance. Um, I literally had to bleed for this scholarship. Um, the, at UBC, um, they know, uh, let's see, uh, my ability to maneuver myself and bathe myself they know that in intimate detail. They have a list of all of the medications I take, including the psychiatric medications I take. Um, and they have details of the various hospitalizations I've experienced that are quite traumatic. Um, my CPTSD originates from medicalized trauma. And so now UBC has a folder, several folders, I think, um, of those traumas. Um, and I want people to think about the kind of vulnerability that that creates for me in a university setting, um, in universities that are the progenitors of eugenicist research. <clears throat> and I also want to emphasize that um, something that a lot of activist movements talk about is the power of refusal. That is the way that accommodations work right now completely curtails my ability to refuse. So I, again, over and over again, have to dredge up my own medicalized trauma. And that's not saying that all disabled people experience their disability in a traumatic way. This is my personal experience. But I have continually had to reperform that trauma every time I try and apply for any sort of accommodation. Um, I have to go through doctors. I had to get two doctor's notes in order to rent a computer monitor the other day, and that took months. Um, so uh, yeah, the accommodations approach is a way of reinscribing institutional violence in a way that I, I want um, able-bodied allies to really think hard about and think about ways that they can help disabled people not have to go through those institutions institutional um, channels. Thank you so much, Hannah. DP. Hi, um, so uh, I think uh, Hannah really summed up really perfectly, but I just like to add that each person with a disability had a, like, are different. And I think um, that what professors or faculty or, or anybody needs to accept 
and um, that people with disabilities are um, going to have different um, ways and different accommodations and those accommodations need to be met or, or respected and that's a big thing I think that you know you can't endure that and I think a lot of people um, especially maybe UBC I can't really say but are trying to ignore that or just hope that people with disabilities will just go away and um, accept it and that you can't do that. So that's the problem and that's what we need to change. Um, but to answer the second question, I can't really answer that one because I haven't been in those kind of situations. So I will allow the next panel to, panelists to answer that. Thank you so much, DP. Just quickly, I some very good advice that I got once doing research was sometimes no data is really important data and to not have been in uh, a, a setting that you can say is accessible or <laughs> an example of disability justice can, can say quite a bit um, if you can't really come up with an example. So thank you. Um, Heather. Oops, Heather, I think you're muted. Um, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a common ableist narrative in education is that there are cor correct ways to speak or read or have mobility. And so from a young age, educational institution, uh, like they prioritize verbal language over sign language and reading print over braille. Um, they create environments for children who walk, but only meet like the very bare minimum requirements for children who roll. And I think accommodation centered approach continually makes us fight for access almost as if it's unexpected, even though these different learning styles and these different needs have always been part of the education system. Um, and that is a huge problem is that um, accommodation centered education says there's a right way to be and a wrong way to be. And those who are the wrong way have to then fight for their space, even though it is our right to be there. Um, and I think that continual fight for a right that we already have um, is exhausting. It, and it requires a knowledge transfer. Um, disabled mentors often help those who came after them. And while I'm proud to be a crypt doula, I'd be even more proud to not need crypt doulas because if we had systems that weren't as complex, that weren't like mazes, that each of us have to fight through for each of our identities. As Vivian said earlier, you know, if you are disabled, that's one thing. If you're disabled and queer, that's another. If you're disabled, queer person of color, um, these are more mazes getting added again and again. Um, to me also, accommodations rely on judgment and often that's from people who have no medical knowledge. And so as Hannah said, we're giving very personal medical information to people who are making decisions about whether we are disabled enough, whether we have the right disability, and they often don't have the experience to actually be able to make that kind of decision. And that's very frustrating to know that the very people you rely on don't have the information relevant to be able to make that decision. And the accommodations also don't allow for flexibility and how chronic complex health conditions alter and how they are not a fixed thing and how they change from day to day. And for the person, how it changes with how they are learning about themselves. People with disabilities are at very different points in their own knowledge about their bodies and senses and brains. And so it also creates an inequity for those who are just learning about their disability as opposed to those who have more experience or those who are able to be more vocal about what it is to experience their disability. Um, and that's a huge inequity within accommodations is that if you're able to explain it in a way that the institution understands versus a way that you have lived it. Um, and so it's again, it's playing a game to an audience that doesn't have the experience and that doesn't have that lived um, perspective to actually be able to make that judgment. And that is, very disheartening to have to rely 
on a system and on people who don't know what your experience is. And I think also the relying on people whose timeline is not the same as yours. So having to work with professors or people at the university who don't understand how much you need the accommodation now and not when the semester ends. And I've spoken to so many students who have said that they did all the right paperwork, that they had everything ready before the semester and they got approval the week after the semester ended. Um, and this is a huge problem because that's a semester that's lost. Like they were not able to give everything that they could. Um, and that's lost both for them personally, but also for the institution in general. Um, so I don't actually have concrete examples, but I really just think that uh, the accommodations centered approach is not just insufficient, it's incorrect because there should be the assumption that there are disabled students and the university should be better prepared that the accessibility, whether it's for people, you know, with whatever type of disability is to be provided and that you shouldn't have to jump through so many hoops in order to access it all. Thank you so much, Heather. Laura. All right, to build on, add to what folks have said, I think uh, one more thought I'll throw out is what are accommodations? And we're all making accommodations for ourselves. We use Siri to do math um, or to look things up or to figure out what the weather is. Um, and those are common things that the quote unquote normies, the, the folks who are considered non-disabled, who are framed as, as the ideal, um, they use accommodations if, if we can consider those accommodations. Um, so that's a, kind of a, a thought to ponder. Um, it's just our accommodations are considered special and therefore burdensome. Um, and then also, uh, thinking about accommodations and and why that approach is perhaps insufficient is um, to add to what folks have said that it feels like making accommodations sets people at ease. So like, oh, well, that person now has accommodation. So now they are able to access the learning or the space or the workspace. Um, Therefore, it's fine. We've done, we've done our part. We've, yeah, it's all, it's all good. No, it's not all good because you didn't expect me to be here. Um, you, you needed to change what was. And I'm needing to try to fit in to what's here by having accommodations um, rather than coming and being who I am. Um, and that's belonging. Um, so a couple of thoughts, and I really want to talk to your questions, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I don't want anybody to stop. I'm loving this conversation, but um, yes, uh, just so that we can finish up before the break. Vivian, please. Um, I like what you said, Laura, about the term special needs. I do not like it. We all have access needs. We're not unique in that aspect. Um, I've also seen Interestingly, instead of saying students with disabilities are disabled students, students with access needs is now the new term. Very interesting. Um, but when I uh, read this question, immediately I thought of paperwork as violence, um, paperwork as violence, um, because often it's perceived that, okay, we're just going to check if you, you required certain accommodations. Um, but a lot of the students I've met who do have a certain disability that don't have quite the right paperwork to meet stringent requirements, um, they don't get that access or they have trouble filling out the application form in the first place because it's in an accessible format or um, the whole application thing is too overwhelming because it's yet another thing they have to deal with on top of existing barriers. And, and it all comes down to, like others have mentioned, there's being a right and wrong way to be disabled, even though by virtue of being disabled, we already defy these norms. So very, very strange how they're trying to sneak in these euphemisms around framing us as not being needed uh, here. It's, it's really, 
it's really disheartening. And um, the whole culture in the disability service centers that provide accommodations, um, like Hannah mentioned, they, they work for the university. Um, and often because of that, they're just one step away from calling disabled students cheaters. I, I'm not exaggerating here. Um, students get told often that the reason that they're denied an accommodation is because it would give them an undue advantage. And again, again, I see students get told this, and then they go on through the course, they fail or do incredibly poorly, and suddenly, oh, okay, the center realizes, ooh, the accommodation they denied was actually necessary. Um, so students are set up to fail first before getting any help. So failure is seen as evidence of needing support. Um, of course, this has huge, huge impacts on the student's GPA, self-esteem, trust in the institution, and so on. It's all reactive. It's not proactive. Um, in its very nature, the accommodation space is when it's super ableist. Um, and like DP, honestly, I had a very hard time thinking of positive examples of accessibility or disability justice. Um, I'm not sure if we have time, um, but I'll quickly recount something that may, I don't know if this counts, but sure. Um, but a while back, uh, I was in a course where autism was one of the topics, um, and the professor knew that I was involved in autistic activism and invited me to be involved in part of in that part of the course um, he allowed me to edit his slides in a way that preserved the original slides but basically i took a red marker to them highlighted the parts that were really ableist that were like medical ableism and offered suggestions on how to rephrase them wherever possible or some parts that i said look this is just a huge problem there's no way you can fix it um, and then i gave a short talk on neurodiversity and the social model of disability versus the medical model of disability. I found that one particular case was an effective way to expose students um, to what science academia, I'm in neuroscience, uh, would teach them about autism while challenging it through the perspective of an autistic person. Like, here's what you're gonna see, uh, but it's bad, it's wrong. Um, so I, I really appreciated the professor deferring to my lived experience and expertise and, and basically just giving me the microphone, quite literally. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vivian, for that. Um, these were amazing answers to these questions. Um, and I would love to let it go on longer, but I do want to get to the audience Q&A. So we will quickly take a break. Um, everybody, feel free to grab a drink of water, relax, take a breather, whatever you need to do. And we'll be back here at 7.14. Um, if everybody could be back for then, and we'll get to some of the audience questions. Thank you so much. 714. All right, let's get started. So we're entering the audience Q&A portion of um, our webinar. Um, I will read out uh, the question for everybody. I, we might get through more than one. My guess is we will only make it through one question. Um, 
So the question that uh, was the voted up to the top of the list here was, um, <laughs> I think it's a common, common experience. Um, how do you advocate for change to make a program more accessible? I felt like I was phased out of my master's of OT due to my disability and lack of accessibility and denying slash refusal to accommodate very toxic and ableist environment. Um, so if everyone's all right with it, we'll just go in the same order again. Uh, that's the question. How do you advocate for change to make a program accessible? Hannah. Um, I think one of the things that uh, disabled people need to, well, that I think disabled people should be empowered to do more often is quit. Um, because sometimes it is not worth you staying in a program where you are consistently marginalized and treated as subhuman. Um, there are long-term effects to that. And I wouldn't want you to emerge from that program hating your occupation. Um, and it's okay to leave. Um, it's okay. Uh, it's not a failure to leave. Um, I, I responded in, in text to uh, this question and I said, really it's um, non-disabled people's uh, responsibility to change the culture of a program like that. Um, it's not, uh, I've been very lucky. My program is certainly not perfect, um, but I sent them the link to this webinar and there, and there are several people watching it. And I feel comfortable saying that my program is not perfect. Um, that's an incredible thing in and of itself. Um, and they have also um, met me where I am. Now, some of this comes from being a graduate student and not an undergraduate. Um, there are certain privileges there. I'm also a fairly articulate, outgoing, white person. Um, so I think, um, I really think with this question, um, as much as it pains me to say it, it's someone else's job to make this program better. And um, in some ways, uh, I'm incredibly glad uh, that you are not, I hope you are not facing this kind of violence still, um, because you deserve a program that treats you like a human being um, on just a base level that welcomes you and uh, does not treat you this way. Thank you, Hannah. Deepi. Yeah, hi. Um, I agree with Hannah. I would probably quit as well, especially when I don't feel that I can give 100%. And honestly, quitting is not like a bad thing. It, uh, you have to kind of remember that it's not you, it's like the system or it's the people running it. So um, don't feel bad. Um, and that's it's hard to do. Also, because you feel like, oh, I need, I need to make a change, but it's really not you. So I think we need to accept that, that, you know, mentally for ourselves that um, we can do what we can. But at the end of the day, it, it has to be everyone. And um, if you don't feel included, then maybe it's not something for you right now, maybe down the road. You never know, or try something new. Thank you, DP. Heather. Oh, Heather, you're muted again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would echo what was already said in that um, sometimes you have to ask kind of what is the effect that it has on yourself um, and how is it affecting you I've talked to so many students who force themselves into situations that are not good for them. And by the time that they finish, not only do they feel like they didn't give their, the best that they could offer, but that they have lost some of themselves in the process. Um, and I think it's really important that students um, prioritize what is most important to themselves. And that is different for different students. So 
For some, it is achieving the degree or finishing certain classes. And for other students, it is knowing that they gave their all, but, um, but ultimately chose to not bang their head against that wall over and over again. Um, so I think it's, and that's the big thing is it's different for each student. And I think each student needs to decide for themselves what their limit is. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, I think um, building on what folks have said, I also acknowledge that that's, that that's tough to do in the way that leaving a program is framed in our society as failure. Um, in some ways, I would encourage you, if you make that choice, to think about it as, as, as power. You have the power to make that choice. Um, and I also, um, I also think I, I emphasize that idea that it's not our responsibility alone to change the culture of an inaccessible program. Um, and to address the question more broadly, not necessarily just for you, um, in that program, but changing inaccessible programs. Um, I do want to highlight the value of different ways of knowing um, and different ways of communicating and something like the arts and how communicating through art can help to shift um, some of those some of those cultural pieces that make a space inaccessible. Um, so just one concrete example of something that I've um, witnessed to be uh, powerful um, in terms of shifting in accessibility. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Vivian. Yeah, I would like to echo that leaving a bad situation is a good thing. Uh, I think just to boil it down really simply, leaving a bad situation is a good thing. Um, but I also recognize there is a tension of, uh, like, wh what is the line? How much can we bear or how much can we put our effort in to change? How much, what's the point where we start to say, no, I have to walk away? Um, and as someone who's still in it, who's still doing my undergrad, um, finding community was the best way for me. Like, um, I think Hannah wrote in typing down. Um, you can't change things alone and it shouldn't be on you, so just to echo everyone else. Um, finding people that are like you struggling in similar ways, I find that cross-disability activism does work if you band together um, and it doesn't work without it. So like, um, it. It's very difficult to get into a position of power to actually advocate for change if you're not combining your voices. Um, because already the people up top, it could just be one ableist dude at the top, and he can just say no. But if you got a lot, a lot of people saying no back, then that makes a difference. Uh, so find your people is my second piece of advice. Know when to walk away and also find people, even when you're walking away, because making that tough decision, oh, that's very difficult. And you're not alone for meaning to go away from a, an ableist environment. Like that's such a common thing, right? Fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, it's, it's interesting. I think the conversation has sort of come full circle and we're back to what is lost, you know, when people are pushed out of their programs because of uh, toxic and ableist environments, what's lost to the university and what's lost for those people, what sort of harm has been done to them individually um, and what responsibilities then does the university have to them um, and to the university community? Is it okay that um, <laughs> this was the top voted question <laughs> um, that apparently you know, resonated with so many folks. I think there is an expectation that uh, disabled learners are supposed to fade away rather than graduate. Um, so 
not to end on a downer note because um, we have had such an incredible conversation, but I think uh, what everybody's pointed to is that there's power in stepping out of a toxic situation. There's power in community. There's certainly power in these conversations. And so I want to say thank you very much to all of our panelists for sharing their their power, their wisdom, um, and uh, their experiences. Um, grateful to each of you. Again, Hannah Facknitz, D.P. Lail, Heather McCain, Vivian Lee, Laura Bulk. Um, we will, we didn't get through <laughs> the audience Q&A, so we'll check in with the panelists um, afterwards and see if they are all okay with sharing contact information in case anybody wants to get in touch um, with them. And then we uh, We'll send that out in an email afterwards. Um, we'll also be in touch um, about recording so that folks can uh, watch parts that they may have missed, rewatch your greatest hits, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, I want to say thank you again to our CART captioner, to our ASL interpreters, um, Cindy and Jillian, and to our sponsors. Um, again, U-Town, Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, and the uh, UBC Geography Department's Equity and Diversity Committee. Um, and finally, uh, one more enormous thank you to um, Amanda Ma and Rachel Chang, um, who put in an enormous amount of work. Um, and in terms of you know not being able to do it alone, <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to do any of this alone. Um, and so I'm so grateful to the both of them for all of their incredible work. And again, this has been a wonderful experience in um, cross-ability organizing. Mm -hmm.